Welcome to Om Times TV, a division of Om Times Media and Broadcasting. Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello, welcome, and today my guest is Cynthia Jules, founder of the Gaia Mandala Global Healing Community and the Nonprofit Alliance for the Earth, a Dharma Charya in the Order of Interbeing of Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh. In 1990, Cynthia met a 106-year-old Lama in his cave in a remote corner of Nepal and asked him, what can we do to bring healing and protection to the earth? His answer was to give her an ancient practice from Tibet and the daunting task to procure sacred earth treasure vases made from clay and potent medicines, fill them with prayers and symbolic offerings and bury them around the world in the earth's most potent places and troubled lands. That's quite an assignment. And I think, what was that, about three decades ago, Cynthia? And it did propel her onto a quest um, that has taken her to many corners of the world through uncharted territory, from war-stricken Liberia to the Standing Stones in Avebury, England, to the outback of origin Aboriginal Australia, to the nuclear laboratory in her own yard before eventually returning to the cave where it all began. We're going to hear more about that fascinating sacred task and Cynthia's pilgrimages a little later in the show, after she shared the 10 books that inspired her the most on that extraordinary life journey. And probably is still inspiring you, Cynthia Jules, welcome. Thank you so much, Sandy. It's really wonderful to be here. So first, tell us about your relationship with books. Hmm. Well, I'm an avid reader. I, I love books. Um, books have carried me far and wide and have been great teachers to me. I've had many great teachers in the flesh, but I've learned a lot from books uh, my whole life. And so um, this assignment was really a joy to do a, a whole life review of, of, of the books that have moved me the most. And of course, it was really challenging to come up with 10. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. I bet there's loads of them that you're thinking, just if only I could have included that one and that one and that one. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I'm 10 it is. Occasionally we let someone briefly mention an 11th, but uh, we can't go too far beyond that because of time mm -hmm. constraints. But let's mm -hmm. talk about your first book, which is The Way mm -hmm. of the White Clouds, a Buddhist mm -hmm. pilgrim in Tibet by Lama Anagarika Govinda, published in mm -hmm. 1966. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This book was, I, I just got goosebumps even just thinking about it, um, Sandy. When I first encountered it, I couldn't put it down. And I was really young at the time. Um, it was in the probably mid-late 70s, um, late 70s, and I read it and I you know, had this deep longing for a spiritual life, but I hadn't found it yet exactly. And Lama Govinda, who was a, um, a European, I can't remember which country he came from originally, but he made such a deep um, connection with Tibet and traveled all around with his partner, Lee Gotami. Uh, and they, they documented their travels um, into these very remote 
and and untouched places. You know, this was before Tibet um, was discovered by the rest of the world, before the lamas really started coming out and teaching and all of that. And so he gathered so many of the teachings and brought them forward for us. And, and his descriptions just filled me with longing, you know, and I think they really awakened um, my own connection to that culture and those spiritual teachings. Do you remember the, how old you were? And sure, you know, the path of the pilgrim. Yeah, sorry, yeah. go ahead. How, how old were you when you read this particular book? Let's see, it would have been, I would have been about, yeah, between 17 and 21, somewhere in there. Yeah. 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 Was it one of the first? It was. Time? I read, I, another one that I read early on was Autobiography of a Yogi, which uh, by, by Yogananda, which was also um, kind of in the same vein, you know, just really bringing forward some of these teachings that in a way, both stories were so personal that um, it made it easy to identify and, and enter those worlds. They weren't teaching books necessarily, although there was mm. a lot of in them. And so, um, yeah, so that was... That was a beautiful book. He, he's a beautiful writer. Um, I feel as if I read somewhere, and I can't remember where I was trying to pull this back, that he considered himself a reincarnation of Rilke. I don't know, and I probably shouldn't even say it because I, it's not sure, but mm. somehow it, it resonated with me to, when I heard that. Mm. Yeah. Your <laughs> second book, um, Women of Wisdom. Sultrim yeah. Alioni. I've uh, interviewed her. Yeah, Alioni. Mm -hmm. um, I've interviewed her and I loved her books. Loved it. Yes, her mm. books are fantastic. And she's done mm. such an incredible service to women in the Buddhist Dharma yeah. world, in particular, to highlight their stories and to bring forward the feminine within the context of this very patriarchal. Uh, traditional system. And this book was her first book uh, where she gathered the stories of many of the women in Tibetan Buddhism who, who we never hear of, you know, because mm -hmm. their stories aren't, aren't uh, valued really inside of the, the tradition of the, of the male patriarchy. I mean, the lamas always appreciate the, the feminine, but um, there's a lot I could say about that, but I won't go into it. It's just, it was such a relief to, to, to find that book. And, and when I did start reading it, which was really and truly one of the very first books um, on Tibetan Buddhism that I, um, mm -hmm. I did read, um, I had some very profound experiences of what turned out later I discovered was, was the goddess Tara in all her 21 uh, forms kind of rising up out of my heart into the space in front of me, both during meditations while I was awake and in my dreams. And I, it was catalyzed by reading those stories um, to have this feeling of deep connection to um, the feminine uh, uh, spiritual embodiment of Buddha nature uh, known as Tara. Mm, so yeah. I'm of course her own story is quite you know, extraordinary too. Sultram's story. Yeah. Is that what? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I, I met her early on, uh, early 1980s. Um, and we, she invited me to teach some retreats with her that we did and um, have been, have remained um, friends ever since. And, and yeah, her story is, um, is, is a, is a very special one for us today. Yeah. And, Interesting that you said this book literally fell off the shelf as you were preparing to do a retreat in the 80s. That's right. It's funny. I, I bet you've heard that from other people, um, how that so happened. So many times. So yeah. many times. Yeah. It's so yeah. amazing because it does happen. And you're, you know, you're yeah. contemplating something as I have writing my own book, you know, and I'm trying to find a source and then suddenly this book just goes boom you know that's what happened with this book I was I was needing guidance for my very first uh, solo retreat and 
I went into this bookstore and there it was, it was just went boom. And, and then the, the bookstore owner said, you should read this. <laughs> so I, I took it and it changed my life. And then you did a retreat with her. <laughs> I did a retreat shortly thereafter with her. I sought her out. She was actually in Northern California where I lived. And so I, I met her and then we became uh, close, close friends. And, and uh, she and I, I accompanied her on a, on a pilgrimage to Tibet with her teacher at the time who became my teacher, um, Nam Kai Norba Rinpoche. Um, yeah. So that was kind of the beginning of, Many, many things. Mm, yeah. yeah. Book number three is Being Peace by Thich Nhat Palm, which was published in 1987. Yeah. Yeah, so at the same time that I was um, in getting involved with Tibetan Buddhism, I was also um, becoming a student of Thich Nhat Hans, and I met him um, also in the... Um, mid 80 mid 1980s um on his second trip to the u.s after being exiled from vietnam um i heard him speak and um i was profoundly moved by his um call to engaged buddhism um i loved how he wove together his activism coming out of the vietnam war with his practice his spiritual practice of meditation and uh, the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha. And um, he, uh, his first, he had written already several books in Vietnam, but his first book under the um, auspices of Parallax Press um, was Being Peace. And I actually contributed to uh, its publication. And uh, <clears throat> it's a seminal book. It, it, it was um, really laying out his, his call for being peace, you know, instead of talking about peace, for us to embody it and, mm -hmm. and from there to be able to make a difference. Um, and so anyway, it was, it was um, the beginning of a very long-term relationship with Thich Nhat Hanh, yes. Mm -hmm. And book yeah. number four was also by him, Love Letters well, to the uh, Earth. What a beautiful title. I love this book so much and all of his books are are so well done and he's he is a poet and he's um, a great scholar. Um, he writes also very, very simply and as I think I may have mentioned in my write up, he always used to start his Dharma talks with the children in front. And for the first whole half hour, he would speak to them. And so he would use very simple language that of course um, all the adults in the room benefited from and could understand uh, very well. But um, he, uh, people are deceived a little bit by him because he, his writing is often so simple in his teachings, but underneath is this incredible depth of understanding that he had um, and, and uh, brought forward in, in many of his books. But um, this one spoke to me um, directly because of my concern and love for the earth and and really my um, as as my own dharma practice evolved, uh, I have come to see the earth as my greatest teacher. Um, so I, I there aren't very many Buddhist teachers who have recognized that, um, and Thich Nhat Hanh really did. And so this book came out. It was one of his last books before his stroke, um, and I think he was a little surprised at how how much of an effect it had, but it coincided with the general public really starting to wake up to the fact that we have to listen to Mother Earth. And so he, um, he wrote these love letters to her and in the course of each letter and his kind of commentary on this, the letters, he um, brought forward our, our, our relationship of interbeing with each other and the earth and all the beautiful systems of the living earth that we need to protect and um, and take refuge in. Yeah. So it was a call. And in fact, I mean, yeah, go ahead. This, I mean, this is something that we've known since the beginning of time. And, you know, every culture, um, you know, has shared this. But I don't think 
we really fully get what that means. I read a book really, it was a novel, but I, it did feel like a novel. It had so much wisdom and it was set in um, England in just after the Romans had left. And it was about the a family and the king and how the king had to have this relationship with the land and mm. all the magic that people thought, you know, made him a king actually came from his relationship with mm -hmm. the land. Mm -hmm. And it brought home to me in a whole other way, you know, what we really mean when we talk about this symbiotic relationship with the yes. earth. Yes. What was that book called, Sandy? There was something about the sisters. It's a new book. It's been getting a lot of attention and I don't remember the full title, but it was, you know, mm -hmm. about these three daughters of the king who all had abilities in different ways. You know, one could put her hand on the earth and she could literally feel the oneness with the trees and everything, everything. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the others, you know, had healing capabilities, etc. Again, it's it's really about our relationship with nature mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how but when the king loses that. Mm -hmm. If he loses that relationship, which, of course, you know, after the Romans, many of them did, um, you know, then the earth can't support the humans in the same way. Yeah, no, it's it's in, uh, maybe the most important connection that we need to sustain life on earth. And to be a leader, one needs to understand that. I think that that is yeah. um, that theme is featured in the story of Parsifal and the Holy Grail, when King Arthur is ill and um, and the the land the connection to the land has been lost, and so I, I'm hearing yes. a little echo of that there. But um, yeah, this is what my book is about, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute. But um, no, it's it's mm. really to me this is the call not just to the kings or the, the, the leaders, but to all of us to, to make that connection with the earth as the source of life and to honor that source of life um, so that we may continue uh, and to not uh, lose the way, you know, which we have. We've really lost the way. So it's an amazing time to be alive in order to reclaim that connection. And hopefully, you know, we have time to do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we will talk about, you know, your own experience a little bit later. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to mention that book, because I have a question directly related to that for you. But we'll keep mm -hmm. that till a little bit later. Um, book number five is You Are the Eyes of the World. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. this one, um, this is a translation by mm -hmm. Kennard Lippmann and Meryl Peterson. This was published in 2000. So tell mm -hmm. us about this book. <clears throat> well, this is, this is the work of um, um, a, a, a great mystic of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition um, named Long Chempa, who um, wrote, lived and wrote in the 14th century. So, you know, it's, it's incredible to think back the brilliant, vast, uh, awakened understanding of some of these um, saints and mystics that lived back um, so long ago and brought forward their teachings in the most beautiful poetic mm. um, kind of transmissions, you know. And this book um, comes out of the the lineage of known as Dzogchen, which means the great perfection. And these teachings are, are, are incredibly profound. Um, I learned about them first through this Lama named um, Namkai Norbu Rinpoche that I mentioned before. And he was kind of the teacher that these translators um, were working under the auspices of um, to translate this book. Um, and it's a short text that um, when I read it, it brought me into the experience of what we call the view, you know, this, this view of um, awareness itself, 
sometimes called the nature of mind, which the Tibetans always love this. When they talk about mind, nature, they always point to their heart. So it's not, it's not up here in some intellectual way. It's like mm. this embodied experience of, of, of knowing, you know, that is really beyond words. And so to have a text that takes you into that experience through words um, is, is, you know, a, 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 I was going to say a great art form. You know, it's, it's, um, it's the gift of an awakened um, master to be able to, to do that. So um, I, was, I, was, I was quickened, let's say, by reading this book and to, to come into the experience of, of the great perfection teachings. How did you come across this book? It was introduced to you by one of your teachers, did you say? Yeah, um, Nam Kai Norbu Rinpoche was my first uh, Tibetan um, teacher, and he was very prolific uh, himself um, and had a lot of students who were also very prolific at translating things. And this was one of, Kennard Lippman was one of his um, students who took it upon himself to translate this text. And so they, um, they had their own publishing um, arm, and I attended so many retreats that you know, I saw all the books that were available and this one just was another one that jumped out at me. But, um, you know, when I, when I read it, I was, I, my thinking mind stopped, which is a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it took me into a state of being that yes. um, was, as I said before, really beyond words. And um, I mean, the, 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 the title of the, of the uh, uh, text in English is the jewel ship, a guide to the meaning and pure, the, excuse me, the, a guide to the meaning of pure and total presence, the creative energy of the universe. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so just that, I mean, you could <clears throat> get a lot out of just contemplating what that, what that might mean. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you say that there are some books in your library that are underlined the whole way through. And our next book, book number six, Fearless Simplicity, The Dzogchen Way of Living Freely in a Complex World. And I won't even attempt to pronounce the author's name. I'll let you do that. But um, that was published in 2003. Yeah. So Sokni Rinpoche um, is Sokni. the author. He is the son of one of the great um, masters of the previous generation, uh, Tulku Orgyan Rinpoche, who, um, and, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to characterize these, these amazing teachers. But so Sogni Rinpoche uh, is one who's kind of a bridge person from generation to generation, from the older, very traditional Tibetan Buddhist um, um, way of, of, of transmitting the teachings to, um, to us, you know, those of us who are coming along later, who live in the Western world, who are, you know, um, trying to wrap our hearts and minds around this view, um, but from a more contemporary place. And Sokni Rinpoche is very skilled at, um, at, at bridging those worlds through his teaching. And he's, um, so I, I, I really uh, bow to him, honor him. And so, yeah, this was one of these books. I mean, you know, it, it, hap it happens when you pick up a book at a certain time and it's the right moment and every single word just goes in. And so I was um, in a deep uh, phase of my life where I was really practicing deeply, doing a lot of retreat, a lot of sessions of meditation every day. Um, and... Uh, <clears throat> this book um, and being with him in retreat uh, in person um, spoke to the core, you know? So it was like, yes, 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 yes. I get it. Okay. Mm -hmm. this and that. Oh, and that, and this and that, and how, mm -hmm. oh, and he, yeah, you know, so it's, it's just so exciting. And um, yeah, when I was going through my library, there's many of these uh, books about Dzogchen that I have, read and loved many teachers that I haven't mentioned here, but um, because this one was underlined so much, I thought, well, maybe I'll mention this one because it is very approachable. At the same time, it has a lot of depth. So um, if you want a, um, 
uh, a kind of overview and way in this, this is a good one. Fearless simplicity. What, what could be better than yeah. that? Mm. Fearless simplicity. Yeah. <laughs> um, number seven is Buddhism without beliefs, a contemporary guide to awakening by Stephen Batchelor. This was published in 1997. And you say that this is the book that you give to many secular friends and family who want to have a better understanding about the Buddhist path. Yeah, yeah. I come from a family of sort of atheists, really, or agnostics, better. Um, and, uh, you know, so they had trouble understanding me. <laughs> uh, and... And, you know, there's a lot of people who are, I think our world is, is more secular um, in some ways. Of course, it's more fundamentalist and everything else in other ways. But um, I, I always, you know, I love, I love Buddhism because it really doesn't ask you to believe in something outside of yourself. It doesn't ask you to believe in the Buddha as a, some sort of God. Um, it, it, it's, describing the experience of a living person called Shakyamuni Buddha who lived um, and who had an awakening and who is then taught his awakening to his friends and those who came along after. And as Stephen Batchelor says, it's not really something to believe in, it's something to do. It, you know, we practice meditation, for example, in order to, um, not only calm our reactive emotions and patterns that, that keep us going around and around in what we call samsara or the cycle of suffering that is just endless. Um, we, we practice meditation also to, to be able to, to have the capacity to, to go to the origin of that suffering, to see it for what it is, to understand, to experience it and not, avoid it, um, but to go into it so that we can be free of it, to transform mm -hmm. it. And so I really love how Stephen Batchelor has um, brought out uh, the, um, this, this view, you know, that in a, in a way, and, and the word Buddha just means awakened one. We all have Buddha nature inside us we all have the capacity to be wise and compassionate and 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 clear you know as vessels um but he he really went back at a certain point Stephen Batchelor to the original texts of the Buddha and of the Buddhist teachings that were brought out after the Buddha died and um evaluated them you know to really look at um what the Buddha actually said and um and not what we have layered on top of it as some sort of mystical um, idea of, of what we wish he had said, maybe, uh, mm. if that makes sense. So um, I bow to Stephen Batchelor. He's a, he's a wonderful um, contemporary um, teacher who is also a great scholar and um, has done some amazing work um, for us today. Mm -hmm. Book number eight is one that really intrigued me. The Elder Brothers, A Lost South American People and Their Message About the Fate of the Earth mm -hmm. by Alan Herrera. Mm -hmm. Herrera. 1992. Tell us about this one. I mean, it oh. sounds like uh, something quite different. Yes, it is. It, 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 um, it was another life changer. And um, so, so the Kogi... Um, are the people who live in Colombia. They live in what they call the heart of the world, up in the, the mountains. They call them the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, Colombia. And they, um, you know, many, many, many generations ago, they decided to close themselves off from the rest of the world and not have contact because they, they I mean, well, there was... Um, the colonization of the Americas that what had happened and, and they didn't want to have anything to do with that. And they have a very amazing visionary culture, um, which this book 
uh, describes. But what happened was in the late 80s and, and early 90s, their um, spiritual leaders who are called mamos, they were uh, seeing the effects that that were happening in nature, even way up in that remote part of, of um, the world uh, as a result of what we were doing to destroy the fabric of life. And um, they call themselves the elder brothers because they've been around for a long time and they, they have this understanding about um, how how things work in balance and harmony in relationship to the earth. And they consider us to be the younger brothers and sisters who really don't have a clue what we're doing. And we are doing a lot of damage. And so they, they, they made a decision to come out in order to give a warning to us about the fate of the earth. And they, um, Alan Herrera was a filmmaker with the BBC and he, uh, he was um, invited to come and make a film about this message and also write this. And so he also wrote this book and um, <clears throat> hearing them uh, from them um, catalyzed me in, in many ways. It was hearing from them uh, that catalyzed me to ask this old llama that you mentioned in the beginning um, that I met about what we could do to bring healing and protection to the earth. I was, I was profoundly um, affected, al already caring very much about what I was seeing taking place as, as things were beginning to unravel. Um, and this book, um, you know, really, really, uh, I don't even know what to say right now. It, it, it moved me at the deepest level about that. And so the Kogi are one of four tribes in that part of the world. There's um, the Wiwa, the Arawako, and the, um, um, oh gosh, there's another, a fourth tribe that I can never, never quite remember the name of, but they consider themselves all together to be, um, these elder brothers and sisters who are now more and more coming out, unfortunately, you know, out of their, their place, um, trying so hard to help us to wake up. Yeah. So you said that there was a movie um, which was called From the Heart of the World, The Elder Brothers Warning. Is that still available? Do you know? I believe it is. I haven't, I have it on a, on a DVD, um, I'm pretty sure it is. I think it wasn't for a while and now it is. Um, you can find it, you know, online. And there was a second film that was made called Aluna uh, by Alan Herrera. Many years later, it came out just, I don't know, maybe three or four years ago, five years ago as a follow up. Um, I don't think Aluna was as well done. Um, it wasn't as compelling uh, and as deep as the first film was. So if you're gonna, if you're wanting to see it, um, if you can, please find the first one um, from the heart of the world, the elder brother's warning. And that, that's the one to, and then, and then watch the other one. Mm. My two cents. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Book number nine, Entering the Ghost River, Meditations on the Theory and Practice of Healing by Dina Metzger, published in 2002 and described as a book that September 11th called into being. Yeah. Yeah. So Dina is um, maybe not as well known as, as, as some other people I could have mentioned, but um, she is an extraordinary um, in a way, medicine woman, um, healer, uh, writer, prolific writer. She's written many, many books. Um, and also teacher of writing. Um, I've worked with her personally um, quite a bit. We have a history together. And um, she cares very, very deeply about what's happening to the earth and um, is always asking, um, you know, what do we need to do to live in such a way um, as to be, bring healing to the world? And um, also for a viable future. 
And um, as I mentioned in my write-up, she has, um, she's a real visionary. She, she, she's a dreamer. She's a writer, storyteller, um, listens very deeply to um, the, the animals as, as, as bringers of wisdom, um, as well as um, her own, um, you know, she, 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 I guess you could say she, she's inviting us all to really form an alliance with spirit, with not what we think we know, but with spirit in a, in a way that's now, I could say this is her, her teaching is not at all Buddhist, you know, and that's my home path. But Dina is is um, inviting us into an, an awakening in in relationship to the earth and in and all beings in a way that, to me, um, uh, strengthens the Buddhist teachings. Um, and her nineteen ways for a viable future for all beings came through her own listening to the guidance from something so much larger than herself for these times. But this book um, it was really a, an exploration kind of leading up to that, you know, what, how, how can we live? How can we um, sustain a future, not just for ourselves, but for, for the elephants, for example, who live um, in Africa and, um, and, and who are carriers of such wisdom you know, but what would we do without them? How will we live without this kinship to all of life? And so she, she, she brings out this web of connection in a way that um, weaves many, many threads uh, over many cultures. And it's another book that I underlined quite a lot. Mm -hmm. I learned, I, I've learned a lot from her. She calls on the ancestors. She enters different cultures and times. She, um, she, she's rigorous in her um, capacity, you know, to really go deeply with this, this kind of material. And uh, you know, that's what we need, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the last book on your list is uh, World as Lover, World as Self by Joanna Macy, published in 1991. And Thich Nhat Hanh wrote the foreword for this one. Yes. She and Thich Nhat Hanh have, have had a, or did have a, a, a good connection, a long, long, long lived connection as, as I have with both of them as well. And um, I met Joanna in the eighties. Um, she has been a mentor of mine. Um, and uh, so there was kind of this period of awakening for me in the, in, in the early 90s, 1990, 91, that time frame where I met Thich Nhat Hanh, where I met the, came across the Kogi, I met the old Lama in the cave. Joanna Macy was talking about, at the time, um, nuclear guardianship and the need to wake up to the... the proliferation of, of nuclear weapons and power yes. and also the, the radioactive waste that is produced by those things that is then just being thrown into the ground and is changing the fabric of life on earth because these substances are, are so intensely um, powerful and long lived and really change the DNA of um, of our uh, systems when we are exposed to them. And so she, she was um, a, a powerful voice for um, this uh, coming into my consciousness because also I live near the Los Alamos National Lab where the weapons, uh, the first atomic bombs were built and, and still today they are producing these things. So this has been a big catalyst for me as well with my question to the old Lama. And, but, but her, her book, World is Lover, World is Self, is, has that in it, but it also has so much more. She's, she's um, another weaver of, of story and of her own life experience and of um, her calling, taking into account the Buddhist teachings, which she's very deeply immersed in, as well as the, the teachings of systems theory and um, her own activism. Um, she, she, uh, 
as many people probably know, you know, went on to found what she calls the work that reconnects, like a little bit like Dina Metzger's um, 19 Ways. These mm. are, these are um, you know, paths for us to follow to find ourselves in these times in a, in, when there's such um, uncertainty, you know, about the future of life on earth. And I find Joanna's, um, you know, personal experience of how she came to all of this um, deeply inspiring. Mm, it's been um, reissued twice sort of a 15th, 16th anniversary and a 30th anniversary. And it's interesting that, um, you know, the first printing had no uh, first edition, no subtitle. The second one carried the subtitle Courage for Global Justice and Ecological Renewal. And the third one is Courage for Global Justice and Planetary Awakening. Yeah. Mm, yeah, subtitles to fit the times. Exactly. And it really is... Uh, obvious, at least to myself, that planetary mm. awakening is the call. You know, globally, we need together to wake yes. up. And so this is the time that we're living and we have this opportunity. And Joanna is now 93, I think it is. And so this came out a reissue, you know, just a, a year or so ago, uh, celebrating really her life and her her life's work um yeah so i have strong prayers for that planetary awakening yeah yeah so you know i was going to ask you um of all of these you know incredible books and authors mm -hmm. um you know who you would most like to sit down and have a conversation with but you probably already have, because <laughs> you know most of them. <laughs> well, I don't know, don't personally know Long Chempa. He lived in the 14th century. Right. So that would be really interesting. <laughs> I what would, would you ask him if you could? Wow, God, what a question, Sandy. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe I would ask him something along the lines of what teaching would you have for us today in light of what's happening? And why is it taking us so long? Yeah. What's it going to take? Yeah. What's it going to take? Yeah. Well, that's your 10 best list. Let's talk about you now um, because I'm sure everybody is uh, very intrigued to know about your journey and this incredible sacred task that you undertook. Is it complete? No, <laughs> I'm not sure it will ever be complete actually. It's, um, <clears throat> it's going on and on. And so I, <clears throat> I received these, what we call earth treasure vases from the 106 year old Lama in the cave when I met him in 1990 when I asked him, what can we do to bring healing and protection to the yeah. earth? And um, <clears throat> it took me, it took me the better part of 30 years to, to carry those treasure vases out around the world. And what's, what, what the practice invites is for us to uh, fill them with prayers and offerings, symbolic of healing and protection for the earth, and then take them to places of need where healing and protection is called for. And of course, <laughs> that's pretty much everywhere. Um, and so I did that with those first 30 and um, went all over the world. Um, and I was helped by others who also took them, um, some of them. Um, and then at a certain point when I was just about to finish the, the last of, the, um, of those 30 in Australia, I was sent um, another 40 um, that were about <laughs> sent them to you. <clears throat> so the person that I went to meet the old Lama with um, was also uh, interested in this. <clears throat> he was my partner at the time. His name is Jim Casilio. And he asked for um, a number of these as well. And his teacher was the same Lama I mentioned earlier, Namkai Norbu Rinpoche. And he gave most of them to Namkai Norbu Rinpoche's community. But he had some in storage and he sent me 40 of them. 
uh, we were no longer together, but um, he knew that I had really taken this um, on and that there was a huge need. And so he sent me those 40 and uh, I took uh, the first four of those to Australia because it's a whole continent and the people there were very engaged by the practice. And so then we started this second generation of these vases going out. And at that point, I started to um, teach the practice to others to, to take it where they wanted to and where it was called for. And um, every place that we took one became like another node on a global healing mandala, really, like this kind of web of of light that we imagine in the meditation that we do every full moon, um, which I now do online on Zoom every full moon and have for since since then, you know, all these years. And it's a way of keeping this practice alive. It's a way of um, uh, kind of energizing the different locations. And so there's now this, this global healing mandala, this global healing community all around the world of people who are either have already taken treasure vases um, or vases here or there, or are in the process of doing so. And of those second generation vases, we still have about 10 or so left. And we have now a council of, um, of people who have been deeply involved in this practice alongside me, who are kind of overseeing the stewardship of, of these vases as they go out. And um, last year I led a retreat with a Native American um, potter and activist named Marion Naranjo here in New Mexico, where we crafted another third generation of little holy vessels, as Joanna Macy named them, um, that are also going out in through the, the, the lives and the hands of, of those who made them. So um, it continues, it continues. And I don't know, you know, where it will go from here. It, it almost feels as if this kind of global mandala of locations at a certain point, it, 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 I, I should say the vases, vases themselves, when you start to work with them and fill them with your most heartfelt intentions for healing and protection and renewal for the earth, they, they literally start to feel like they're coming to life because they're, they're just so imbued with, with this profoundly meaningful intention. Yes. And, and then that is planted like a seed in the ground in the places where that is called for. And then people who have come together to pray into these vases and hold them and to, you know, pour their hearts into them, you know, really they are active, they are activated as holy vessels. So it's as if then the prayers come to life really through all kinds of ways. And especially through those of us who care. And, 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 and so, there's, so there's sort of that level of it, but then now there's this level of this whole mandala of locations all around the planet that are in a sense, um, you know, you could almost feel them being alive as one so that we have the, the kind of power to draw from when we do invoke them that is contributing, it's rippling out into, as they say in the, the Australian Aboriginal tradition, the song lines of the earth, you know, the meridians that, that carry the life force energy of Mother Earth out. And um, so it's beyond me. It's so, so much bigger than what I could ever have imagined. And I, I just um, hope and pray that um, this is contributing. And I think it is. Contribute. When you um, did the first one, that must have been quite an experience for you. How did you choose the location? And what did you feel when you put it into the ground? Mm -hmm. Well, when we first started you know, I, at, at first I was so overwhelmed with the assignment that I had no idea what to do or where to go. And so they sat in, in, a, in my closet for 
like five years. And then finally, there was this feeling like the earth changes were starting to become so much more visible with forest fires and, and drought here where I live. And, and, and also this laboratory that makes these bombs, you know, which is right over there. And um, I, uh, I realized that the, I, I really had to take the first one to, to address that laboratory, to, to what happens there, to how it's affecting the web of life. And, um, and just before I answer about putting it in the ground, the, the, the next ones, it became clear. I, I've always been very inspired by the idea of bioregions as opposed to political sort of boundaries. And so the bioregions of the world are usually defined by river systems and the, the, the ecosystems of, of, of the land, which is how people originally lived in relationship to the earth. And so we decided as a sangha, as a community, a meditation community here, to um, put the first five in this bioregion, marking the center and the four directions. So the, 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 the one to the north was at the source of the Rio Grande River, which is the main river that runs through, going all the way down where it empties into the Gulf of Mexico at the border of Texas and Mexico. So this, there, one of the vases went to the mouth of the Rio Grande so that it, because rivers are supposed to carry the prayers very beautifully. And so then the other two to the, to the east and the west went on top of two of the highest mountains in this region where again, you know, watersheds um, begin and, 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 and are also very powerful um, sites. So that was the beginning, the, the four directions and then the center being the, um, a place above the Los Alamos National Laboratory that um, I don't name uh, because the vases are never really supposed to be dug up once they're in the ground. And I don't really want people to know where they are exactly. Um, but, uh, and that's a tradition, you know, according mm. to the tradition. But when we, um, when we put it in, uh, as has happened in other places as well, you know, it felt like the vase was just entering into the body of the earth herself and just going in and, and being taken. <laughs> and, and as it went in with all these prayers and offerings, you know, um, that it was entering into that, the fabric and, and like rippling out and you can, you can feel it. You can feel it when, when, when you do this, um, and so, yeah, so, you know, it's like, wow, <laughs> um, that was powerful. It's like acupuncture, you know, when yeah. the needle hits the, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the spot, the, um, the mm -hmm. point, and then it, it takes it to the whole body. Um, it's a lot like that. I can imagine that, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of this as like seeing this map with all these little dots and, you know, connecting, um, and that one could almost meditate with that in mind yes, and connect with that energy. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there is a map on the website. There's, there's a gaiamandala.net is the one website that, that I have now. The other one that's older, which is not as active, is called earthtreasurevase.org, and they both have maps. And um, we're in the process of filling out all the stories uh, for each of the locations on the map on the Gaia Mandala uh, website. So uh, you can go there and see that, yeah. Have you noticed any, anything happening in those areas? I mean, I think when HeartMath were doing some work um, in certain areas, they were able to measure changes in crime rates Mm -hmm. Have you had any evidence of any change in those areas? You know, every place we have gone, things have happened. And it's really interesting to notice that because, you know, you, 
you make your offering, you put the needle in the point, and then you just have to kind of get out of the way and see what, see what occurs. It's now in the hands of something so much larger. Um, uh, but in certain locations, very tangible things have happened in, in other locations, you know, it's a little more subtle, but, um, nonetheless, just as powerful. So a couple of the more tangible stories I could tell you are that, <clears throat> well, when I took a vase to, um, the coast of Oaxaca in Mexico after, a um, major hurricane had just wiped out um, the whole coast. And we took this treasure vase there and um, buried it in a place that is called Punta Cometa. It's a um, like sacred, sacred place for the indigenous people of the coast. And at the time, this was a long time ago in the 90s. And at the time, um, nobody really knew about that place, but it um, has been discovered. And but at the time, so there's a beautiful story that's in my book about the burying of that vase. Um, we put it in, and and, and uh, it was just accepted so beautifully. My husband and I went back about five years later to to be at the location, and we were sitting there at sunset, and we thought, well, we'll just do a meditation um, where the vase near where the vase is buried uh, for the sunset and stuff, and and we were sitting and all of a sudden all these people started arriving and they were all arriving in silence, incredibly respectfully, like in little groups of two or three or maybe more or one at a time and coming for sunset at Punta Cometa. And everybody either sat down or stood and watched the sun go down in this very meditative um, state. And that hadn't been happening before the treasure vase went in the ground. But the treasure vase, I don't know, you know, the, the power of its presence there sort of invited that naturally. And it continues to this day. Mm. So that, that's one example that I love. Another one happened when I took a treasure vase to Liberia. And it's a much more intense story because Liberia um, in Western Africa is a country that suffered terrible uh, civil war for um, 13, 14 years. Um, I was invited there by Dina Metzger, um, whose book I mentioned. Um, she was working with a group called the Everyday Gandhis who were doing um, uh, peace building work uh, during the war and, and after the war, really interesting work. And um, I met a bunch of people from Liberia and was invited to bring the treasure vase to the worst fought area of the war up in the very northern part of the country, bordering Sierra Leone and Guinea. Um, so it's a bioregion where there's a, a, a three countries share this whole region and, and there was fighting during the war. And that's where I went in to take the treasure vase. And um, it was, again, a story that's told in my book, but um, um, the vase eventually was accepted and the people wanted it there. And we buried it in this... Um, in this village that was identified through trance of the women dancing with the drums to see whether the ancestors were going to accept this and then determining where it should be buried. And, um, you know, I didn't know, I didn't, I, you know, you have to go into these cultures and places with just with this offering and, and then get out of the way because they may or may not want it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I was really grateful and happy that they did want it. And um, so the, it was buried in this, in this village. There were like 500 people from three countries who came to pray for peace into that vase because the war had been so awful. And, and the vase held this, you know, and then it was buried in this, in this little village. And, and the, as soon as it went into the ground, the elders who were there said, well, now what? you know, we, we want to remember these prayers. This is important to us, uh, you know, and I mean, it's not for me to tell them what to do. And so uh, one of the um, former uh, uh, commanders of the uh, uh, army, the, the, the resistance basically um, suggested who had been a commander in that area, he suggested that they build a peace hut 
which is a structure, a traditional round structure where people go to resolve conflict in places where that exists and to remember something, you know, beyond <laughs> what mm. separates us. So they, they decided, he, he had the idea to do this and they decided to build it. So our nonprofit raised the money to build it. And, and then I went back to dedicate it. It was, it's been an incredible story as, which has led me into over a decade of peace building work with these people, including this former commander who um, had been, you know, a, 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 a terrible, um, <laughs> you know, leader during the war and who, who became a peace builder and who now um, has, has had a complete change and total transformation of his life. We've now built um, five peace huts in different conflict prone regions of Liberia. And the women who, the women were the ones who stopped the war in Liberia. There's a whole amazing story there too. And, and so the women are the ones who, who lead people in um, skills, learning skills uh, for peace building and conflict resolution. And our, our team, uh, works with former combatants and ex-child soldiers and under the peace huts teaching also now through myself and through um, Thich Nhat Hanh before he died and his community, the practice of mindfulness as a tool to come back to ourselves, to recover from trauma, to um, uh, find our way. So it's been wow. an incredible uh, uh, story. Yeah. That keeps going. Yeah. And you went back to that cave when, the cave in um, Nepal, where I met the old Lama, the 106-year-old Lama. Yes, in, in 2018, I went back to um, uh, the cave uh, where he, I had originally met him. His daughter, who I had met back when, who was about 50 at the time that I met him and her, uh, in 1990, was now almost 80, and uh, still lived there. This she's lived in that cave since she was 19 years old, and is a very deep practitioner. Um, and we went back, and we brought one of the treasure vases. I took a, a group, and we went back, and we brought a treasure vase to that place, and so we wove it in to this global healing mandala, and. Oh, I just got the goosebumps. You know, it's just, it's such a rarefied air in that place and in that part of the world. And in, um, you know, it's kind of like behind the veil um, still. And, um, you know, the world is changing in every direction. And there are these little places left just holding on. And that's one of them. And so I was, I was made a llama when I went back. Um, which completely surprised me. I was not expecting that. And um, I don't really know what to do with it because my, my way of practicing is very non-traditional compared to how it's normally carried. Um, but I feel it was basically in recognition of, of my dedication to taking this practice where I have. And, and, and so, um, yeah, I also, I, I don't know whether you knew this, um, uh, it, all of these things are in my book, by the way. Um, I fell on that trip. I fell off the mountain coming back. It was the last day coming back from the cave. We had been all over Nepal doing a lot of things and I had become a llama and I was very conflicted by it actually, because it, it, I wasn't sure where, where the tradition and I fit together anymore. And I, I have been so called by Gaia as the source, you know, of, of awakening really for me and for us all in these times that um, doesn't look to the gurus for that direction or guidance anymore. It's my own feeling that that relationship is very fraught, the, that of the guru and 
mm. uh, disciple. Yeah. And that it served a purpose, but there's something else happening now. And so um, anyway, I was, I was grappling with all of this in a very difficult way, really hard. And I, um, the rain had started and the rocks were slippery and I turned my ankle and I went over the edge and I fell over the side of the mountain. And, and I noticed as I was falling that there was nothing there to stop me. And I was just tumbling head over heels. And I, I mean, I really thought that was it. I left my body. It was like, that was it. But I came to on the side of the mountain and I was actually okay, a little banged up, but I was okay. But I had to get up to the trail. I didn't, I didn't know how I was going to make it. And a porter threw me a rope and I was able to get up back to the trail barely. Um, it was a really, you know, sh close call. And I, it took me a long time to realize what stopped me because there was nothing stopping me. And, but what I came to is that it was the earth who stopped me, who, who saved my life. And so then I really claimed my own calling out of this to um, make Gaia bring her into the center of my life and my spiritual practice. So the book, an amazing story. Yeah, thanks. The, the book is called Summoned by the Earth. Mm -hmm. And it, it echoes also, when the Buddha was enlightened, you know, the story goes that he touched the earth in that moment to witness his awakening. And so he was summoning the earth and in that moment. And so <clears throat> I have, I, I, I play with that, that theme, you know, of being summoned and, and um, um, carrying this whole um healing journey out on behalf of mother earth uh, and what what is the path of awakening now you know what's it going to take like you said mm -hmm. yeah well now that you've shared the story of your falling it makes sense of why i felt uh impelled to tell you about that book because in that book um one of the things you know, this relationship that they had, and everybody had it, you know, everybody in the village had it to some degree, but the king more so, um, the earth would literally move to support them when it needed to. Mm. Mm. And um, who can say? Yeah, who can say? I guess I should read that book. It sounds really good. I'll I send you the details of it, yeah. yeah. Do. Mm. very interesting yeah not yeah. at all what I expected well and you mentioned that one of the daughters or the sisters would touch the earth and the earth would speak to her and so oh yeah this is this is a lot of you know my own practice is um in, in listening to to the earth mm. and and she's got a lot to say you know and and so to be a vessel like the treasure vases have shown us how to be um, a vessel for healing, a vessel for, for um, restoring balance in the world and making offerings, you know, because we've forgotten the indigenous peoples always are making offerings to, to maintain uh, the, that relationship in the right way. So we need to, we need to do these things and, um, and remember, remember the, uh, that there's something else operating here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Cynthia, thank you so much for sharing this. This is just a, it's the sort of thing that you could imagine being turned into a movie, you know, with a few little <laughs> embellishments. But, you know, the fall down the mountain is a good one. <laughs> it, it, it's a good one. Yeah. There's, I've been writing this book, you know, and and I think – Oh my God, it's like a, a mythic tale, really. And mm. I, you know, I'm this character in this tale that just goes on and on. And um, 
So I, I'm looking forward to being able to share that tale more widely. Yeah. Well, let us know when it's published. I mean, it deserves to be published. It's, it's, it's a, you know, I'm surprised people haven't because it is just a phenomenal story and uh, an incredible thing to be doing. Thank you so much. Well, it's, mm -hmm. it's wonderful to be able to speak with you and share all of this with your listeners and um, uh, look forward to more. <laughs> Indeed. Right. Well, Cynthia Jewers, thank you for adding your 10 best spiritual books to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's Library of Recommendations. We appreciate everybody's contribution. Yeah. Thank and again, you. look out for that book, Summoned by the Earth, which is forthcoming. And if you want to know more about Cynthia's work, go to GaiaMandala.net and EarthTreasureVals.org or Vase. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back at the same time next week with another 10 Best Interview for the No BS Spiritual Book Club. Till then, it's goodbye from me. Cynthia, thank you. <laughs>